Our next community panel focuses on strengthening. This is about enhancing the protective factors supporting well-being and preventing harm. The panel is facilitated by Silvana Erin Chun Perez from Sharma. Sharma is a social service agency providing support, advocacy, and programs to women with diverse ethnic uh, from within diverse ethnic communities. Joining Silvana uh, is uh, on stage will be Rachel Enosa from the Cause Collective, a Pacific social change agency. The Cause Collective works with communities to enable well-being, and this includes work with Navaka or Kainga, Pacifica Proud. Imogen Stone, youth development worker at Auckland Sexual Abuse Help, working with DRM program, with the DRM program. DRM supports young people to become leaders by providing them with access to knowledge, resources, and creating a platform where they can, can explore difference, uh, they, the difference they want to make in community. This can include young people creating their own resources, their own projects, and their own campaigns aimed at creating an Aotearoa free from sexual violence. And Ara Greg from Gender Minorities Aotearoa, a national transgender organisation that is enabling takatapui uh, transgender and intersex people to be empowered and to be able to participate fully in society. As with our previous panel, we'll invite two Te Puna Aonui board members to offer reflections on this panel. This time, we'll be joined by Debbie Power, CEO of the Ministry for Social Development, and Chepi Tikane, CEO of Oranga Tamariki. Remember, Fano, to use the Slido tool. Uh, we have had a lot of questions come through that are more directed at government officials or, or government ministers, I should say. However, if you have any questions related to our guests on stage and their mahi, please take this opportunity so that our facilitator can deliver those on your behalf. Please give it up for our panel. Hola, kia ora. Thank you for having us here. I'm a bit nervous uh, moderating a panel in English, my second language. I'm in my journey to learn Tereo, so maybe in a few years I will be doing it in another of the official language. And thank you to hear the lady for being uh, translating to those ones that they can hear. I also want to thank our MC for introducing us in our panel. Like I said, we are talking strengthening today. Is that working well? Yes. Um, in the first part of our panel, we are keen to hear from you about what work you're involved in strengthening families, whanau, and communities. Te Toko Toru defines the strengthening as enhancing protective factors, supporting well-being, and preventing harm. And th strengthening needs to be something we invest in prior to harm, but also once that harm has happened, so we prevent happening again. We break that cycle. Rachel, I would like to start with you. You want to share with us a story about how Pacifica Proud is bringing communities together to protect against violence and what's been successful. So for those of you who uh, don't know about Pacifica Proud, it is a partnership with the Ministry of Social Development, um, Pacifica communities, practitioners uh, and leaders up and down the country. And it has been going for about 12 years now. So it is well known in our, our Pacific communities. There are several initiatives that sit within, under the umbrella of Pacifica Proud. And one of those initiatives is called Nā Vaka o Kainga Tapu, or Nā Vaka for short. And uh, today I'm going to tell you a story about eight ethnic specific Pacific communities, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, who are all working together to prevent violence and strengthen the well-being of our kāinga or family. But before I talk about that work, uh, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge all of our Pacifica leaders who are here in this room and also those who are online. Uh, many who have faithfully been serving in this space for decades. They are the early pioneers and the experts of the story that I'm about to tell you about. And our story begins with a Samoan proverb and we often use this proverb in our work. It is, e fofo le ala mea le ala mea. 
The proverb refers to the crown of thorns starship, which is found in our Pacific homelands. To be stung by the spines of the uh, alamea is extremely painful, but it is known to our people that if you should be stung, to turn the starfish over to its soft, spongy side and to touch the wound on that side of the starfish and it will suck the poison out. The alamea will heal the wound that it has caused. In other words, the solutions to violence can be found within our families and communities themselves. The kainga may often present to us as broken, but there is great beauty in that brokenness and there are opportunities to restore and strengthen what may have once been a source of great pain. The story I have to tell is about eight ethnic specific communities in Auckland and Waikato who understand the strength of their own cultural frameworks and how to draw on their own indigenous prevention systems from long ago as solu solutions for the problems to violence which we see surfing, surfacing in our kāinga today. This story is a story about bravery, courage and the compassion of a group of Pacific community leaders who we call the Champions of Change. They are a community of practice. Well, that's what we would call them as practitioners. They call themselves champions, uh, and we agree with that. They are made up of church and cultural leaders, practitioners, civil servants, young people, and our elders as uh, cultural knowledge holders. They have completed the Navaka training on the cultural frameworks. And now what they're doing is working together to share and to learn and to put their knowledge into community action. And they do this voluntarily. They are brave and courageous because they have held up the mirror to their own families and communities to recognise their own shortcomings and to say, yes, there is a problem. Yes, violence exists. And for many in our communities, it has become so normalised and accepted to be part of our cultural ways. However, our champions of change, they are taking a different view. In the context of our value systems, they are saying there is no place for violence that disrupts or violates the sacredness of our relationships between one another. These champions of change have responded to a community call of, to action and they are leading the way through the development of their own prototypes that are based on their cultural frameworks. They are taking Western knowledge, um, so-called best practice, and they are weaving it together with um, their own cultural uh, uh, ancient wisdom uh, to strengthen well-being and to provide an alternative but complementary approach to mainstream solutions to preventing violence. This story is about looking back to our past to take our families from where they are presently into a healthy, strong and safe future. It is a story about valuing ethnic specific approaches to preventing violence and about communities designing the solutions to their own problems. Uh, and you talk about this story being a part of eight ethnic different groups within the Pacifica community. How is it to bring diverse groups together? Was that much of a trouble or is it actually something that flows? Um, it's very challenging, yes. And so eight ethnic specific communities, um, that, that would, one of the biggest challenges is resourcing and time. Uh, the process that they went through to develop or co-design um, their prototypes, that took six months. But the process of engagement or talanoa and allowing them to unpack what the causes of the problem are, that took 18 months. 
So one of the challenges for us, um, and I just acknowledge uh, the Ministry of Social Development because this has not been a tick the box we're delivering in the contract as it's prescribed. It's had to be, we must go at the pace of the community. Mm. So yes, it, it's, um, there's a lot of challenges around uh, resourcing and time and giving this the space that it needs mm. um, to work across the diverse communities. That is something that is close to my heart, working as well with the well, hundreds of different ethnicities that sometimes you require that time to understand each other and what is important for different values. I see on the screen uh, one question that it says that it's beautiful to hear the positive things community groups are doing, but are we hearing about the struggles? And no worries, my second question will go around the challenges because everyone who works in this space knows that we face a lot of them. So we will be sharing about that as well. Uh, there is another quick question, Rachel, there maybe. Uh, what do you think is good prevention approach? Pre, the prevention. Um, okay, uh, so I think, I'm not sure if I understand the question properly, but uh, essentially the work that the communities are doing is that they're going back to um, our pre-system, so pre-colonisation, pre the migrant journey and looking at the way that our fam what were the protective factors in our families and communities and they are held within our value systems um, and within those cultural contexts. The challenge and the, and the, um, the I think the beauty and the work that the, these uh, communities are doing is taking that knowledge and then working it through to how is that relevant now in today's society in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and helping our children and young people and our families to navigate through the challenges that we see uh, here, particularly when perhaps maybe our village uh, constructs or support networks are not the same as they were in our Pacific homelands. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to you, Emna, uh, sorry, um, Imogen now. Um, share please with us about how Dear M is engaging with young people and enabling their development. We hear uh, before here the voices of those young people and those kids, how it was, and when you hear them, you're like, oh yes, I should have done that. But what do we have to do before we meet them, you know? So how you are doing that work? I'll start off by giving a little bit of context about how our work at Dear M operates. So we bring together a group of spectacular young people who are wanting to be leaders in their own communities, leaders in ending sexual violence. And we then work with them on a partnership model. And that partnership model means that we all hold equal power. Myself, my manager, the young people, anyone engaging in that space, we all hold equal power. And our young people have the power to set our agenda and to set the projects that we engage with. I don't get to decide any of that. I quite often like to say they're like my bosses because they tell me what to do and I pursued their vision. So an example of this work that we've recently been engaging with was um, the consent law reform campaign, which one of our wonderful young people launched last year with our support. Yes. <laughs> um, so our wonderful young leader, Laiba Zubir, launched a petition calling on the House of Representatives to review and reform our current consent laws. Now, that petition gathered over 12,000 signatures. We presented it to our beautiful minister um, and it went to parliament in September and it's now sitting with the Justice Select Committee. Ongoing campaign. Um, and throughout our time on that campaign, there's been a range of things we've done um, underlying that work that's based in the foundations of the program. Things like creating a space where LIBA felt safe to come to us and voice this idea that she had. We had already created an environment where she felt welcome, where she could add things to our agenda and where she could come and ask questions about the areas she just was not sure about. Because as a young person, she should not be expected to be a subject matter expert in our legislation. Bear in mind, she launched this campaign when she was 17. She is now in her second year of law, so we'll see her getting to be a subject matter expert soon. <laughs> um, so we created that space for her to come to us and to feel safe, 
From there, we began running weekly check-in sessions where we could check in on the progress, check on, on all of our well-being, check in on our strategies. We were able to invite in other partners. We went to the sector. We found some sector experts who were keen to come afi this mahi. We went to academics. We brought in them, again, to support LIBA, to just focus on being the young person calling for change and having others come in to speak to those technical aspects so that we could respect her experience, honour her as a leader, and not expect her to hold all of this mahi alone, but also not take it all away from her. Again, is that partnership woven throughout this campaign. And engaging with other young people, there are other young people in our team who are so keen to get involved, but they are not the type of people to stand at the front of a protest or go on the news like our wonderful LIBA. So we engaged with them in different ways. We had them writing our social media. We had them engaging with our community online. We had them helping us to draft uh, letters to MPs. We had them sitting in on Kōrero, sharing their perspectives, their wants on this journey. Throughout this whole process, there was that rap Ooh. There goes my microphone, sorry. Um, throughout this whole process, there was this wrapping round of support around LIBA as our leader on this campaign and welcoming in, any, welcoming in anyone else at any capacity that they were capable and valuing that and honouring them and their experiences. Now, this is just one example of the work we do in this space, how we bring in our young people, how we support them to be leaders. But this underlines all of the work that we do. This is our practice. It is how can we bring them in, listen to them, let their experience guide us through this mahi. And we are just here to feed our knowledge into them and to take the load off them when they need it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. I, I really like hearing about equal power and sharing power because I think that is one of the things that government need to uh, learn how to do. I, I, in the introduction for this panel, they told me that government want to find out how to do better. And one of the things is sharing power. And I think that idea of feeling that the other one is your boss really helps you uh, to take more of a humble approach. So there you are uh, for the CEOs of the different ministers here. Um, we have also a question in the screen for you. Kiora uh, Imogen, what impact do you see your mahi having in supporting the national strategy of eliminating family violence and sexual violence? Just a little one. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm biased. I work with the most spectacular group of young people and I see them as the future of this mahi and I see that a part of this national strategy is investing in that next generation. Um, I quite often talk to folk in the sector who say that their goal is to be put out of a job. They would like for these young people to come in and take over. I'd love to see that. Um, and I think that's a big piece is, or rather there's two pieces. There's one that our mahi is engaging with young people and providing them with a space where they feel seen, where they feel that they are capable of engaging in the national strategy, where they are able to identify their own wants and needs that they're wanting to work with in this space and through that uplifting them to be a part of the sector to give them access to this kind of mahi to network to understand what te arere kura is because i'm sorry but you ask a young person on the street what te arere kura is you show them the document they are not gelling whereas what we're doing is we're building community and we're enabling them to come in at their pace we're explaining things on their level we're making this more accessible to them that's awesome I also want to highlight from your corridor the working at people's strength because I think when we work with people's strength they feel bigger, they feel more confident and we need that when young people if they are going to be leading the path, especially to tell us the oldies now uh, how to do it. Um, Ada, would you like to share with us a story about how your community is leading work to prevent violence and increase understanding about the needs of rainbow communities? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to speak about some of the work we've been doing to try and develop in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, so my name's Ada, I work with gender minorities Aotearoa, who are a wraparound national charity for transgender people. I also work with the Rainbow Violence Prevention Network, which is an organization involving violence prevention organizations. 
So I was just talking about my work with the Anti-Violence Resource Centre, which is a project involving gender minorities Aotearoa and intersex Aotearoa, working to produce resources for those communities. We know that those communities are incredibly affected by sexual violence and family violence, and we know that there's not much support there. We know that because our organisations have been the organisations dealing with these issues. We get referrals from the sexual violence sector, from the family violence sector, and through our peer support, we also deal with disclosures of violence very often. So through the Anti-Violence Resource Centre, we were able to produce a report on the experiences of transgender people in seeking help for sexual violence and family violence. We were able to do that because we knew that was happening. We knew how to ask people what was going on for them. And we found some very stark numbers with 80, over 80% 80 of transgender people reporting that when they sought help from an organization, they were harmed. And that those figures were even worse for government organizations with a third of transgender people saying that they experienced those services as very harmful. Um, so we knew that that information was missing and we went out and we produced that and that is a core part of what we do is working with our community to bring that information in accessible ways and we can do that because of our community focus. We are transgender and intersex people working to create resources for transgender and intersex people. This is a gap that we've seen for a long time. Um, back in 2017, the Thursdays in Black, that's a, that was a student project produced the In Our Own Words research, um, which at the time was said to be New Zealand's first gender minority inclusive sexual violence report. Now that's not very long ago. And that showed us that 70% of tertiary students throughout their sex education minority genders had not been covered. So we're talking about a situation where transgender people aren't able to read about what's happening with transgender people. There are no resources and we've been filling that gap. Thank you. That is incredibly important, like you said, you know. in terms of giving visibility and a voice to those communities that they haven't been here and they need a safe space where they can open. And I guess that is the space that you uh, have been able to, to provide. We are gonna go now um, to, anyone has any question for Ada at the moment? If not, we are gonna go a little bit to talk about the challenges that some people were asking about. Imogen, what do you think is the biggest challenge that you have experienced in working with young people to bring a way for them to engage with issues of consent and participate in advocacy? Representation. Um, I think the Office of the Children's Commissioner before captured it really beautifully um, in that young people don't see themselves reflected in this space. And why would they want to engage in a space that don't, they don't feel welcome in? You know, this, these issues impact them so severely and they are so keen to be involved, but the spaces available to them don't give them equal power. They don't respect them at that same level. Their lived experience is not given that same weight and validity as the experience of those of us in the sector. Um, a little story about this is Last year, our team identified uh, an area they were really curious about looking into was the negative experiences of young people in school systems and school counselling and pastoral support. Um, and so from there, we reached out to a range of counselling associations, uh, counselling schools, and were actually invited to go speak as guest lectures in a University of Auckland pastoral care course as a part of a postgrad dip in counselling. So mostly school teachers retraining as school counsellors. Um, we were stoked to have this opportunity. The lecturer really valued our young people's expertise and was keen to have them come and speak to their experiences and share how they as young people thought that the system could be improved. We went into this lecture and immediately our four young people presenting were faced with questions that you would not 
ask your usual university lecturer questions like, how old are you? Questions that looked to position their identity as other, as something to be taken with a grain of salt. And that is something I see happening a lot, is we are creating some spaces for our young people. We're creating some advisory groups. We're creating some ambassador roles, but we're not inviting them in as partners. We're not treating them as equals. And so when they are in these spaces, they don't feel like they can be heard. And when they're wanting to engage in those spa these spaces, the rangatahi they're already seeing here aren't being treated that great. So why would they want to come along as well? So that's a real challenge that we face in that we are so grounded in our partnership and we are advocating and advocating, you'll hear me as a broken record, partnership, partnership, partnership. Um, but we are advocating to bring young people in as our colleagues, as our equals to really value them and tell them and repeat this to them because they are subject to so many weird power imbalances in this world. They need to be told time and time again that they are equals in this space and it needs to be proven to them. And we're just not seeing that commitment widespread across our sector. True. And I think when we were young, we were all thinking that we knew and our parents will tell us, oh, when you grow up, you're going to change, you know, and suddenly you see yourself doing that. Like, oh, no, listen to what they are saying because they know now. Do you want to do a question? Ada, would you like to share with us the challenge that you have experienced in developing a campaign for healthy and consensual relationship uh, education for the trans community? Yeah, that's. I'd love to talk about some of those challenges. Um, as someone asked about earlier, um, there are always a lot of challenges in trying to get this kind of work done. One of the major things was funding that um, the Anti-Violence Resource Centre is funded um, by a private charitable foundation. Um, we've also, mostly on volunteer hours, produced many free online resources, um, basic introductions to sex education to fill that gap that we know exists. Um, those are available at genderminorities.com under information and then sex and relationships. Um, but we've also um, put that work in raising the profile of those resources and also working with other organizations, including through things like the founding of the Rainbow Violence Prevention Network, which enables us to, to work together to bring those problems together. And through that, we were able to receive um, funding for the Sex and Relationships Education course. Um, for adults. Um, another funded project through the Rainbow Violence Prevention Network was primary prevention guidelines for rainbow people that we're looking forward to being released soon, um, as well as a healthy relationships course um, for um, that that's already been produced and that's basically waiting to go. Um, and all of those things produced in a collaborative nature between those um, more core violent sector organizations alongside the rainbow organizations. And we think that's a, a really special thing and something important that is going to be useful to people um, all across the world, actually. Um, you know, despite the challenges that we had in getting that underway, many years planning to do some of these parts of work. We know that what we've created is really good work. Um, we've seen that get picked up by rainbow organizations as far away as Russia, where they offered to translate it for their local audience. Um, so there's recognition that this really is a, kind of a, a new place to go to find best practice, to find sex education, and to have that be relevant to people's lives including if they're transgender, um, that we're not just treated like an add-on in those resources, that whenever gender or sex is talked about across that education, people can see themselves represented in that. Um, and those are also available from um, that sex and relationships course is also available from genderminorities.com and um, at rvpn.nz, the Rainbow Violence Prevention Network. Um, that's where to look to see those primary prevention guidelines when they are re released, the Healthy Relationships course, and also that Sex and Relationships course for adults. Um, thanks.
Well, congratulations for those awesome resources that clearly not only guiding the way here in New Zealand, not at all, but also in other parts of the world, clearly there is resources that they are needed all over. And I think requires a lot of being very brave because sometimes uh, communities, when they highlight uh, or they develop these resources, they get targeted because they are the visual face of those groups that many people, you know, reject in the wrong way. So. Thank you, Aida, for the work that your community is doing, because I'm sure that it's helping a lot of young people that they are, but also a lot of adults that they were not in the right time to, to come out freely. So, well done. We're, we're really thankful that through the Rainbow Violence Prevention Network, through um, collaborating on Te Arere Kura and through Te Puna Aonui, that we were able to fund some of that really important work, that we were able to put our heads together, figure out what all the biggest gaps were, and we're looking forward to having those resources out there in the world and getting picked up. Well done. Um, Rachel, Rachel, sorry, would you like to share one of the biggest talents that you have experienced in tailoring your violence prevention work uh, to all the people of your community? Um, I've already spoken about uh, the challenge of time and resources to work in an ethnic specific way for Pacific communities. Um, pr probably the other challenge I'll pick up in this talanoa is the challenge um, of the system recognising and valuing indigeneity for Pacific communities. And I use that word indigeneity in recognising uh, tangata whenua um, as indigenous peoples of Aotearoa. Um, but I talk about indigeneity to describe the unique differences between our Pacific communities. There is no country called Pacific. We, ha we come from our own countries. And each of those countries has its different kainga structure. It has its different social structures. It has its own history and language. And um, it's quite challenging for our communities when we get put into that category of Pacific because that is often forgotten. But what we have found through this work, um, uh, just the, the benefit of persisting with an, an ethnic specific approach, that the actual um, levers for change for each of the ethnic communities, there are similarities, but there are differences and it's the differences that will make the greatest impact. And if I just give you an example, the Niue and the Tokelau champions that we work with, their focus was on intergenerational approaches for action. Kiribati and Tuvalu, they opted for prototypes that looked at imparting knowledge and wisdom to young people, and that is because of the way that their social structures are set up. Cook Islands and Fijian communities they chose gendered approaches. In our Samoan and Tongan communities, they selected um, to firstly prototype with faith-based solutions, where the values um, of culture and faith can be woven together and delivered to families and churches. And that is quite representative of those ethnic groups and where they, where they see the greatest impacts for change can be made. So uh, I hope that um, gives some insight into how you manage between, that, that's that fine balance between similarity and embracing the similarity, but also um, the diversity. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, we have some questions uh, there. Um, we have here Mokopuna voices. Now, what are we going to do about it? We can just, we can't just hear all that Viv Correro straight from Mokopuna with no action behind it. Um, I feel like that is more an statement, but I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Probably Emogen has talked a little bit with her work with young people, but it's different from Tamariki, I guess. We have, what do the transgender voices have to add about Pacifica transgender challenges? And I think there is an intersection maybe for Eida and Rachel. Um, so something that I'd like to add about that work that we've been doing across the sex and relationships education for transgender adults across the primary prevention guidelines for rainbow people and the healthy relationships rainbow education, um, you know, very core to the um, 
kind of ethos of a lot of us uh, rainbow organizations as well as those sexual violence and family violence organizations that are included in the rainbow violence prevention network is a very deep collaboration and that includes not just collaboration with each other but also ensuring that there's always disabled people in the room there's always pacifica people who are able to have a look at these resources um, in those primary prevention guidelines, we have different sections for um, for aged communities, for disability, for race and ethnicity, for asylum seekers, and for migrants as well. And on our sex and relationships education, for instance, we're collaborating with Intersex Aotearoa, we're collaborating with sexual health clinics, we're talking to people who are old, we're talking to people who are young, and we're making sure that all of those experiences are taking into account when we're creating these resources, that they're going to be accessible to a wide range of people and that they're going to have different advice for different communities, different advice for people who are working with different communities, and doing our best to make sure that all of those aspects are taken into account. We know what it's like in the transgender community to see things that are meant to be for everyone and don't say anything about transgender people in them. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, take a different approach where from the ground up it's collaborative from the ground up everyone's got something to contribute um i think uh, you touched a little bit about another question uh, from the audience or from online in terms of how our organizations are working with people with disabilities and i guess like you said is having them in the room uh, us that we are war used to work with diverse communities and diversity within our communities, we know that we need to hear the story of each person. We are not just one. Uh, and that means uh, listening to those different uh, needs that everyone has. I don't know if anyone wanted to touch on anything in particular. Yeah, I, think, I think I could add um, not just um, having them in the room, but also talking to organizations who deal with those issues and also making sure that um, that their advice is being taken into account and that it, things are changing in the work because of it. For that, uh, we are going to go into looking forward now, talk about aspirations and, and how is our vision for the future. Ada, you want to tell us about your future thinking and aspirations for how we strengthen the protective factors against violence for people in the trans and rainbow communities and how we can build on that progress? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to see a lot of these kind of collaborative approaches continue um, from the high level collaborations to sort of the, the collaborations between smaller organizations. Those are always valuable. I'd love to see that um, collaborative work um, that the Rainbow Violence Prevention Network is doing be able to continue. Um, soon, on sort of a shorter time scale, we're really looking forward to seeing the primary prevention guidelines come out. Um, you know, continue bringing together those experts and creating repositories of information that people are going to be able to use for years to come. Um, that the best practice guidelines we're expecting there's going to be you know not all of it's new information but a lot of it is going to be information that's been structured in that way for the very first time um also the rainbow sorry the inside out rainbow inclusive healthy relationships education that's already been developed and we'd love to see that picked up and delivered to communities um also uh, other aspirations include just constantly looking for opportunities to get our resources to people, to get them not just in the hands of the services to prevent harm, but also in the hands of our communities, in the hands of transgender people, so that transgender people can learn about transgender people in peace. Thanks. Um, so, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, Rachel, uh, you want to tell us about how you uh, see your future thinking and aspirations in terms of the work that you're doing? Well, th this is, I feel very privileged today because there are so many people who are working in, on the Pacifica Proud 
movement. I'm just one. Um, so what I thought I could do is talk a little bit about what our communities and many of our practitioners have, have voiced uh, their aspirations are as opposed to um, just mine or my organisation. And if, if I had to put it into one sentence what, um, what those aspirations look like, it would be something like uh, self-determining communities supported through authentic partnerships, real partnership. And what does that look like? Well, the things that we uh, are told, the key themes that come through from practitioners, Pacific practitioners and communities, one is about having access to ethnic specific data. We don't know what the true picture looks like for each of our ethnic groups when we're talking about family and sexual violence. And we have asked for many years for that level of detail because we really do want to partner and play our part. But if we don't know what it really looks like for our communities, it's quite hard to um, mobilise and get people to understand the size of the problem. The other thing is about uh, e equitable investment for prevention. And this means agencies um, viewing our cultural frameworks and our values-based uh, prevention systems as legitimate solutions to addressing violence and strengthening well-being in our communities. And part of that is about agencies putting the resource and the power on the table and taking their hands off it and encouraging and, and supporting and being quite intentional about assisting our, com our Pacific communities uh, to become self-determining in this space. Uh, we want to see ourselves in Te Aurere Kura. We want our feedback to be valued and our voices to be heard and included in action. We want to see a commitment to growing Pacific intervention and specialist services for Pacific communities, which is virtually non-existent at the moment. This is so our people have the options. We, uh, and we want to partner with mainstream our services to support us in this journey. And finally, the, the last um, common theme that we hear from our communities, we want our kāinga to be supported, to remain connected to their culture, their language and their heritage here in Aotearoa, as it is our culture which holds the key to strengthening our Pacific families. Okay. Imogen, would you like to tell us what are your aspirations for the aim and how in line with Saurere Kura National Strategy you're going to keep advancing your le youth leadership to shape the campaign? Uh, my aspirations for the uh, hopefully not too distant future are to see more investment in spaces for young people and um, a way that we're currently <laughs> working towards that and hope to see come to life soon is um, through developing a youth collective for the sexual violence space. Um, we, sorry, I'm a story person, so I have to tell a story. Um, we recently had the opportunity to bring together a range of youth-based groups, young activists uh, into a room for a hui with, again, our wonderful minister uh, to talk about their experiences of um, their advocacy and their mahi in this space and the barriers that they were encountering. And through that open corridor with all of these young people, we together identified there is just a lack of a space for them to come together and connect. Um, if I think about my own experience in the sector, of, I know that I can go to Tornest, I can connect with other mahi, I can connect with other uh, people working in this sector. There's not something like that for our young people. They are so isolated in their work and they have to go door knocking on agencies to get invited in. And so that's something I'd like to see come to life uh, by the end of this year, hopefully, is a space like that where young people can come together and uffy each other. They can collaborate, they can network with agencies, be invited in on projects. And I would love to see more investment in spaces like this, spaces that also belong to the young people, so they have their home in this mahi. Um, and on a slightly different tangent, I would also love to see more young people 
in spaces like this, literally. And I am going to give a little shout out to the beautiful table of rangatahi I've been hanging out with today. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to have dinner with some of them last night and we had this beautiful kōrero about what was I going to talk about today and what are the challenges we're facing and I kind of just was left going why aren't we just up here having that kōrero? So, so I would love to see something like that at Future Hui. It's having a rangatahi kōrero where we can just share our ideas, share our conversation, be authentic, because that's where we find in our work, that's where the juicy bits are, that's where the good stuff is. Um, so yeah, th those are my aspirations, is seeing more young people in the space, creating more spaces for them, and investing in those spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Em. Um, oh, sorry, Em. Image. I am like crazy today. We have a few more questions here for our panelists. One is, how do Pakeha Taiwi organizations in this sector honor Te Tiriti or Waitangi meaningfully? Um, I don't know if anyone feels uh, like responding that question now, or we may leave it. That is a big question, is what I will say. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's things like engaging with Kopapa Maori models, just straight up using Kopapa Maori models, working with Maori people, working with Maori organizations, making sure that Maori people have leadership. Um, this leadership decision making power on the work that you're doing as well. I think that's kind of some of the fundamentals to make sure that you're heading in the right direction. I think for, for our communities and for our organization, it's actually making sure that our communities understand the meaning of titiriti and what it means coming into Aotearoa in a respectful situation where we learn about the traditions and the ways that they are important for Tangata Fenua. Uh, and, and we honor that because we value it and we see our reflection, our collective values in terms of respecting family, whanau. Uh, yes, I think it's about learning about uh, Maori people and understanding really well what it means to have a titiriti as the base of this country. Yes, Thank you. Um, so we have what all the panelists are doing are are doing amazing mahi. Uh, how are they finding the ability to access youth with this mahi? What are the major major barriers they may face? Find. Um, I can speak to that. I find the word access in that question quite interesting. Um, <laughs> As if, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interpret this in the way that I interpret it, so apologies if it's not how it's intended. But um, when I hear the word access, uh, to me that speaks about young people as a resource um, and young people as, again, an other. And I will completely acknowledge there are barriers to connecting with young people, so that's what I'm going to go on the tangent of, of what are our barriers to connecting and bringing them in. Um, and I would say, there. I mean, there's a whole range. One that we definitely encounter is just the lack of awareness of the spaces that do exist. Uh, we're not given the resources to go out into our communities and start to build these relationships. So quite often we are left in a position where the young people are coming to us. Um, and I'd love to see that flipped where we are already in their spaces, we are already in their environments, they already know we exist. The relationships are there ready to happen um, rather than young people having to go out and seek these opportunities. Um, another question that we had, <coughs> can see it on the screen now, but uh, how do you feel Tarerekura has impact all this magic? Was already happening or it has been, uh, you know, created or strengthened by the work of the strategy? Well, it was through the um, relationship with Te Puna Aonui and during that development of Te Arerekura that we were able to get many of those Rainbow Violence Prevention Network projects funded. So that's had a, a definite positive impact on our communities because we've been able to create these things that they can use. De definitely.
Um, so probably as I just mentioned before, I think that um, feedback from our communities has been we're still trying to find our space within the strategy and I think that'll be um, an ongoing process. Um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what else to add to that at this point. Um, I would to a degree echo what you said, Rachel, of, um, and part of what I was saying earlier of our young people don't know how to engage with Te Arere Kura. Um, it's not a youth friendly document or a youth friendly piece of work necessarily. Um, it's something that we are working with them to interpret and work out what does that look like in their spaces. Um, so it is opening up, I guess in that regard, it's opening up conversations of how can they engage with these high level uh, government <laughs> strategies. Um, and it is creating spaces like these. So I will give credit to that. I mean, I personally am a young person as well, and I'm pretty stoked to be here on this stage today. Um, so it is, we are seeing from Te Arere Kura, it's opening up conversations, it's opening up some opportunities, but um, there's more, more to be done to make it, um, I think, accessible to our young people. I think uh, the advocacy of many years of many ethnic leaders, Pacifica leaders, regional community leaders, young people uh, make that when they were thinking on Tarerukura, they actually did listen or tried to listen to us, different communities, and bring us together. So I think uh, that is something that really value. I think the team doing the Tarerukura really wanted to uh, listen to those minorities and those groups that they haven't been here. Uh, the, the resources haven't arrived all of them yet as much as we need uh, but I think there are some improvements and like Ada said they got funding for doing some stuff that maybe in the past didn't happen the same for us ethnic communities so it's progress we have seen other strategies so at the end it's about the intention of all of us to make it happen or not and not letting government forget their commitments uh, and their promises I guess we are coming to the end of our panel now. I want to thank Ada, Rachel and Imogen. They have talked and I have heard a lot about collaboration and the importance of collaboration within communities, within Pacifica, within youth, within rainbow, ethnic, but also broadly so we can include, for example, those uh, solutions that people with disabilities already have and that we may be learning or for working with, uh, I don't know, mainstream organizations so we can also work on that. We have heard about the need of more data, especially on those groups that we are being grouped. Uh, Asian community is very different how a Muslim person face violence than maybe how someone from Filipino background will face violence. So those groups, sometimes we need more data and more information to really tell us the stories about uh, how our communities experience violence. We have heard a lot that we need to be listened Rainbow communities want to be listened, youth want to be listened, all of us. But it's not just listen and then we turn the page. It's listening, taking action and reflecting how we change our practice, how we change our way of governing a country, including those voices and incorporating those needs. And that we require a lot of resources and time to build relationships and to find those solutions in a way that respond to all of us acknowledging our similarities, but also respecting our differences and uniqueness, I think. So now I want to thank again to our panelists for such incredible insights. Uh, we have here some important perspectives and suggestions that need to be reflected in the next Teodoro Recura action plan and investment plan. We will now hear some reflections from Debbie Power, Chief Executive of the Ministry of Social Development, and Chapi Tekani, Chief Executive of Oranga Tamariki. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a huge acknowledgement to the Modi in the room, to all of our kaimahi who have come here today, our rangatira, uh, here at the conference. Um, a heart, well, a heartfelt uh, acknowledgement for your main commitment to the work that you do from Debbie and, and I. Um, it's been a privilege for us to listen to the kōrero today and I want to first by start acknowledging our panellists and Sylvia, uh, Rachel, Ida and Imogen for their kōrero today and also the other <coughs> panellists that have come uh, to kōrero to help us share the insights about how we take this important kaupapa uh, forward. So I thought Debbie and I uh, will do a bit of, a, bit of an act uh, where <laughs> 
in, in kind of simple order, <laughs> where we've worked through the order that we've heard today, um, starting with Rachel. Actually, first of all, I acknowledge Rachel's awesome cordial. There was um, a quote, uh, sorry, Rachel, I'm going to steal your quote and plagiarise it because I think it's quite powerful to start our conversation and it goes like this. Uh, <clears throat> there is no place for violence that disrupts the sacredness of the relationships between people. And um, actually, I think that's a pertinent point for this panel around strengthening not just the protective factors, but the recognition of the indigeneity and the power of the kōrero to take um, to take us forward. So let's start there, Debbie, uh, Miss Power. Oh. Um, just to give some reflections on on the essence of of Rachel's um, core point there. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm going to stand because I feel like I'm sorry. Yep. Um, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Up yet. Um, so. Um, in true style, Chappie and I will kind of bounce off one another and um, um, in offering our reflections. And I too want to acknowledge all of you in the room. Um, we've got some colleague chief executives here. Minister, um, just want to acknowledge you. I, I think the judge is here. Francis is here, our Children's Commissioner. Is she here or was here? Anyway, acknowledgement to you as well. Um, um, I think in reflecting on, on the comments that you made today, um, I think there's some salient reminders to us on the board side and both as board members and individual chief executives within individual agen agencies. And I just thought I'd kind of play those back to you and, and hopefully they resonate with you. But there's certainly things that we need to hold true in terms of the way in which we think about supporting this important work. I think for me, Rachel, you know, solutions are within the communities. Um, and with families really is something that we just need to hold on to. And whether that be in communities at place or within communities, um, I think we just need to make sure that that is something that we think about and stop imposing upon communities the things that we think are the right things and, and list, yeah? Cool, that's good, that's good. Um, obviously open our ears and continue to listen. Um, think about how we share and learn what's working in, in places and, and think about how the wider application of that might apply, backing, backing what works. Yeah, so um, don't recreate it, um, back the things that are working. Um, the, over, the overriding issue that came through from all, all of the panellists today was um, earlier, earlier, you know, prevention, early intervention, that's sort of our terminology, but I thought that came through from all three um, panellists. Um, um, Imogen, the sort of notion of power sharing and actually understanding what that means is something that we need to really think through and understand. Mm -hmm. Partnership, and you know, it matters, um, but we actually have to understand what that means and have that conversation. Um, Everybody has something to c contribute. You know, that is so true. Um, no matter um, where or how, people have a contribution. Um, you know, we need to open the door and let some of that in. Um, and we need to think about it, particularly from a young person's perspective, because I understand the, how difficult that is and how difficult the processes that we run as government are, um, and particularly for that group. I think. Um, um, the other thing that I thought I heard, and forgive me if I've got this not right, but in thinking about how we respond to family sexual violence, education is such an important part of it, and I wonder whether we always give it the prominence it needs as we think about interventions. And I think I heard that, so um, I think that's a challenge um, for us. Um, and of course, funding matters, <laughs> doesn't it always? Um, so, yep, got that. The challenges about data, about equitable investment yep. in, um, in prevention, about resources, um, taking our hands off, um, I think are, are real challenges. And from a board's perspective, I think that's something that we can pick up. The, thing, the other thing is, um, I've heard two or three comments about being able to see yourselves in the strategy. You know, and that resonated particularly with me. And so how we as a board think about that and what that means is something that I think we can continue to discuss. Um, 
so um, that's what I heard. Thank you very much um, for today. It's always great to hear the great work that's happening. So I do want to acknowledge the great work um, and the challenge of, but we can do better. And, um, and it's the, but we can do better that I think we need to take forward. So, Nga mihi, kia koutou, kia ora. Ka point. Can I sit there? I'll sit there. Yeah, you can yeah. sit there. <laughs> just, to, just to jump off the back of um, that common thing coming through was the power of the voices. And not just the work that we do, but people seeing actually it's reflected in how we deliver it. So that was, that was quite powerful when acknowledged not just Ada, but also um, Imogen and Rachel's points there, particularly our young people. I would say that there's the, the Chief Executive of Wadanga Tamariki, but um, what I know from the time I've been the CE is uh, the power of that and shifting our decision making is quite important. Um, sharing power, shifting power, power quality, that sets a harsh or violence, okay? so. Um, one of the things we always have to reflect on as the board is um, how we do that. You know, um, Debbie would say, trust our communities and whānau and get out of the way. And I support that because actually we know that's where the solutions fundamentally sit. Uh, where we need to get to, uh, in my view, you know, just using now to a whole room of people, is... Um, not just about shifting power, but actually making sure that that's successful for you. Often the crowd, the government has a view of what success looks like. Hey, we do. Let's be honest about that. We do. And what we're hearing loudly as a board, what we've heard as individual CEs, is the measure of success and what that looks like sits with our communities. We agree with that. So how we translate that into action is really important. I want to explicitly acknowledge um, Ada, because uh, today, Oranga uh, Tamariki has just released a report um, on uh, views and insights from uh, the experiences of Rainbow and Takatapu, Rangatahi, and Kia. And uh, it speaks to the challenges and, and uh, courage of those young people in Kia wanting to put their story forward. Um, it was led by the community, and I make that point quite clearly because for us, we didn't want to filter the report. We didn't want to shape the report. It's very much, and I see Liz in the room, um, and while I acknowledge Liz, one of our managers, it's very much their voices in true raw form that's now publicly um, released on our on our website. And uh, most of that core all comes from um, their experiences, not just in care, but also in, in whānau and different settings. Um, finally, I uh, want to um, also speak to um, some of the um, uh, important initiatives that we currently have underway, just to reflect the voices that we heard um, and today, just to acknowledge that. But um, I think for us, Powerful that we've been here. It's been a real privilege. I want to acknowledge the commitment to Mahi being done by all the leaders in the room and uh, as members of the board and as CEs, um, we're totally committed to taking this initiative forward. Tēnā tātou.